Hi, I'm Adrian Cockcroft. Over the years, I've given a lot of talks on microservices and cloud architectures. And there are some ideas I always wanted to illustrate with a short animated sequence. So I've worked with a visual design team to come up with a series of animations, each illustrating a specific concept. This talk's on migrating to cloud. Over the years, a lot of people have asked me about the cloud journey that Netflix went on. And I've talked about it over the years when I was at Netflix, and I've helped a lot of people uh, since then. So I'm going to bring this up to date and figure out what lessons we can learn from the cloud journey. And one of the interesting things is that in many companies, the cloud migration starts with a shock. In 2008, there was an assumption at Netflix that uh, IT could make systems perfect so developers didn't have to think about failures. We were running on high-end, expensive IBM P-series hardware, Oracle database. Then there was a two-day outage caused by uh, a hardware failure. Uh, that really started some questions in, uh, in the company at management level and across the whole company. And we decided that availability really had to be an application concern. And if we were doing that, then we needed, didn't need to be on expensive hardware. We could use low-cost cloud infrastructure. So many companies, there's some kind of outage or, or, or an that gets people to start thinking, are we doing things right? But in addition to that, you need a existential threat. You need something that's going to push you to go through all the way through the transition. So it's not just enough to ask the question, are we doing it right? You've got to have something pushing you in a certain direction. In 2009, we realized we needed a vast increase in data center capacity. We didn't have time to predict how much, where we needed to put it. And it came from online streaming replacing DVD shipping logistics. And this is very similar to many organizations where their IT has previously been scaled to how many, how many employees they have. But in future, they've got systems of engagement where their IT is scaling with how many customers they have. So what happened at Netflix to start off with, there was a DVD business. And mostly people sort of on a Sunday night, they choose the movies they wanted to see next week. They do some browsing. They'd add some choices. The shipping plan would go to the shipping site. And then on Monday, they'd put a stack of DVDs in the mail, and a new DVD would arrive. And maybe put another DVD in the mail a few days later, and that would trigger another DVD getting sent to you. So the interactions with the website were kind of once a week, and you watched a few movies a week because you were limited by how fast the DVDs shipped back and forth. So that's the old world, and that is kind of a bit like some traditional enterprises' interactions with customers. They hear from a customer when they first ship something, or when, the, when there's a service call, or uh, some kind of uh, special case of interaction, but it's not the normal case. If you look at the streaming business for Netflix, people are now binge-watching episodes of TV every day. So you might watch five or six episodes in a day, and again, you're adding choices, you're doing personalized browsing, but it's a little bit different when you get to delivery. Your, the video data is being sent via a CDN, you're watching it, and the system is logging your progress, so if you stop halfway through, it knows where you got to. The quality of service is being managed and monitored, so the system knows what bit rate you're looking at and whether you had a rebuffer and how well, how well it looks to you. So you can hit play over and over again and watch lots and lots of content. Now this is happening during the week, so you might watch, say, 10 times as much content on streaming than you would ever have watched on DVD. And the interactions that you make with the website per view for streaming is, let's just say, 100 times more than the interactions you'd have if you were uh, choosing a DVD. So what does that look like if you take 10 times the views per week and 100 times the traffic per view? is that every customer that decided to stop using streaming rather than DVD to consume Netflix was generating about a thousand times more traffic to the data center per week. And this really caused a crunch. And we're seeing this across lots of industries. You have a growth rate that's kind of what the old traditional growth rate. And then you have a new workload coming in a systems of engagement workload that really ends up looking fairly much vertical on the same chart. And if it's a thousand times more traffic, then when a tenth of a percent of your users are using the new system, 
you're kind of equal. The amount of traffic coming into the data center for streaming, you know, crossed over and started to match what we were doing into the data center to handle the DVD. So the problem here is we needed to figure out how to build data centers fast because customers were switching over to streaming quite quickly. So there were two choices. This is back in 2009. We either recruit a world-class data center operations build team, try to guess how much capacity they need, build it before it was needed, and put lots of upfront spend into that. Or we could use the Elastic Compute Service of AWS, which was built by one of Netflix's biggest competitors, and spend that money on video content and developers. The choice we made was to do the second. It made more sense to us to invest the funds that we had available on video content and developing the service and leverage AWS. So in 2009, we looked at how do we mitigate the various risks here. So we were early into this space. First of all, we had some calls with AWS to understand how AWS was separated from Amazon Prime, got comfortable with that. We did some capacity experiments to see what worked, how fast we could grab systems, could we actually deploy what we would think of as a data center worth of capacity quickly. And we set up uh, with one of the uh, first enterprise license agreements with AWS because we weren't going to run Netflix on a click-through license and a credit card, uh, which was kind of the predominant way in 2009 that most people consumed AWS. And finally, in April 2010, there was a New York Times story about Netflix and AWS saying, we were about to go do this. Um, at the time, uh, the people I talked to, a technologist around the industry, thought that uh, we were pretty crazy to be doing this. We were one of the first companies to do it, and it was uh, a fairly unproven strategy at the time. But what we did was we went through and we figured out how to do this. First thing was to look at some applications which weren't really customer-facing. We looked at encoding movies. We had a big backlog. We didn't have enough room in the data center for the machines that were doing the encoding. So we moved it to EC2. We showed that capacity existed on demand. We, at one point, said, give us 3,000 machines. An hour later, there were 3,000 machines. And that was, um, we just shared that around the company and said, you know, this, this works. We can grab enormous amounts of capacity. And then as the backlog shrunk, we could shut those machines off and stop paying for them. So the idea here that you could get as many machines as you needed to get your encoding backlog done as quickly as possible, it didn't cost you extra because what you were really buying was machine hours. You could buy a thousand machine hours for one, you know, over three hours for, to get your 3,000 machine hours, or you could buy a hundred machines for 30 hours. It cost the same, so you may as well get more machines and run them for a shorter period of time. And this is one of the uh, very useful things. It just shortens all of your batch processing times without costing you extra. You don't have to pay for the idle time afterwards. Next thing we looked at was the quality of service logging that I mentioned earlier. There was too much traffic going to the data center databases that were getting overrun and there wasn't enough storage for all of the information we wanted to save. So we moved the storage to S3. It's basically unlimited space there. And we moved log analysis to uh, Elastic Map Reduce. We did it with we were early users of Hadoop, and we worked with AWS to, to support Hive as a processing option on top of uh, EMR. And in 2009-2010, uh, we switched over to running uh, primarily using EMR. So what did this look like? We got into 2010, and we decided this looked like it was going to work. We decided not to build any more data center capacity. And we decided that we really had to move predominantly the front-end workloads to AWS before the end of 2010 to survive based on that decision. There's a relatively slow increase in capacity needed during the year, first part of the year. But as our US-based traffic increased at Netflix through the winter, as it got darker at night, people watched more TV, and through Christmas, and Thanksgiving through Christmas, traffic increased greatly. So we had to get stuff done by the end of the year. So this is what it looked like. We first of all started moving web pages and API clients to the cloud, and the back end we switched over. We made space in the data center to increase our back end footprint, and the front end moved to AWS. That migration 
It worked pretty well. We got the front end. It was sort of a forced march. We had a big deadline and we didn't have a backup plan. So everybody had to concentrate on getting it done. So to do that, we had this interesting analogy. Um, we showed people a picture of an aircraft and it was going to go down the runway and at the end of the runway was a pile of trees and you did not want to hit the trees, you wanted to take off and there was a nice cloud. So we wanted to be off flying in the cloud by the end of the year. And that kind of concentrated people's minds and we, we got through this. The, the last few pages were migrated sort of in early December and there was no capacity outages and everything went off and was working fine. So how do, we, how do you do that? This is a common question. What's the right sequence? And what we did was we started with the simplest possible services, API service, and then the simplest web page, and then pages and APIs, one, one by one, bringing in different services behind and different data sources behind so that we could roll the system out gradually. And the way we did that with this gradual migration is customers were coming in on web pages or, or API calls, and they'd go to the data center, and that's where most of the system was to start with. But we started redirecting into the cloud selectively, so that for a certain page, we'd say, okay, some proportion of customers, let's see if we can run this out of cloud, and we'd have a knob we could turn to send a few people there. If something went wrong, we could turn it back. So we're basically using the standard uh, HTTP redirects to send traffic to the cloud. That was uh, the, what we did in 2010. But we also had to move some data out of Oracle, and we had to do some continuous replication. So we wanted to put the data sources in the cloud and have what we call system of record data, copies of that in the cloud, as well as having the main system in the data center. So we had continuous replication going into the cloud. We had some updates coming back. And the web pages that did lots of updates, like your, the, if you wanted to edit your account page, we left that in the data center for as long as possible. Be, but most of the time, people are just browsing around, looking at the, whatever uh, shows they might want to watch. And that would come from the cloud or using a copy of the data. So that was 2010. 2011, we decided we wanted to move everything from the data center to the cloud and the back end, the, the databases. So that's kind of the next stage. And one of the questions we had was how to back data up. To basically use cloud as a system of record, we needed to do backups. And we were using you know, off-site tape backups, a good standard practice. But to do that, we felt that uh, we didn't want to be copying data back to the data center and putting it on tape for all our cloud services. So we created a separate account in a different region, copied the data there, and used the security and durability of S3 to make that into a, a alternative to tape backup. Uh, we set it up in a separate account so that you couldn't delete data and we had an automatic purge and it saves against uh, some things like account takeover and some of the issues that you might run into from a security point of view. More recently, uh, AWS has added uh, the ability to do very low-cost archives using uh, Amazon Glacier so you can have a, a migration strategy that says after a certain period of time, your backups or your archives get uh, put into a, a lower storage class, a lower cost storage class. So it's kind of what it looks like. We took backup data and uh, we took data from all our databases, um, MySQL, Cassandra, DynamoDB, all the different things that uh, Netflix uses and data that was just sitting in S3, made copies, local backups into S3 and then did a migration into the different region in a different account, compressed, encrypted, and archived it. You want to use, um, typically, if you're compressing a backup that you think you might use soon, you want to do a very efficient, uh, a CPU efficient backup. You want to do it quickly. Uh, but if you're going to store data for months or forever, you want to rerun it with a compression that is designed to make it as small as possible. Um, and it doesn't matter if it takes a bit longer to do that compression. So the final stage we're at, uh, this happened uh, just a few years ago. So it took a few years to get to. And I think these migrations are speeding up over time. When we did this back in the Netflix days, we had to invent a lot of things. We were building things that hadn't been done before. Nowadays, there's a pretty well-worn path. There's a lot of good tools. Uh, the uh, database migration service from AWS will really take care of migrating all your data back and forth for you. And we, in the, back in the Netflix days, we had to build this ourselves. But what we're seeing, fin the final stage is you want to close a data center. That's when you get into corporate IT, billing, 
and those machines that no one remembers what they did and you have to just go through sort of um, industrial archaeology effectively of what does this do, who does talks to it and actually shut everything down. Some things went to SaaS vendors, some things went to, were just shut down, other things were migrated to the cloud, some of them were rewritten, some were just moved over. But basically all of the runs on, on cloud and you know, if you go and look at the, uh, the Netflix case study on the AWS uh, website, you can find you know, they're a more recent update of what they've been doing and the sort of scale they're at right now. They're running um, over 100,000 instances and supporting over 100 million customers nowadays. And you know, I left Netflix over three years ago, but uh, like I say, I, I, people keep asking me what I learned from that story and I wanted to gather it into a little presentation for you. So I hope you enjoyed that and uh, I'll see you in the next one. I hope you found that interesting. Please let me know what you think via comments or Twitter at AdrianCO and stay tuned for new stories. Thanks for watching.